This podcast is brought to you by Always Possible. Alwayspossible.co.uk Happy New Year! Well done! You made it. It's the future. It's 2024. We're all here. We're all raring to go. Uh, And this is the first Possibility Club one-on-one interview of this year. Uh, It's mid-January. Or whenever you listen to this, who knows, you could be checking in in June. But this was published in mid-January and I am grateful for you continuing to spend some time with me. Um, I think this year is going to be awesome and I think it's going to be awesome largely because of you. So thank you already. In the Possibility Club, we look at change, we look at leadership, we look at impact, we look at those people rolling up their sleeves to get on and do stuff with the skills, talent, resources, ideas that they have in a world in turmoil, to be honest. A world of flux, a world of conflict, a world of rapid advancement, change, and sometimes we've just got to step back, take a moment, break some bread. That's what we're doing. We're breaking some bread um, and having a conversation, and this episode is no different. But in this episode, brace yourselves, we're delving into the world of global financial services, banking, fintech. And we're going to focus on bravery and ethics. And I have a fascinating guest who can shed a little light on a world usually kept behind many closed doors. My guest today has carved an impressive career marked by courage, a commitment to stewardship and good governance in financial markets. With over two decades of experience in the industry, he's earned a reputation as a true pioneer. But this is an industry marked and dogged by, let's be honest, greed and mismanagement and, you know, an elitism, a deliberate elitism that can sometimes make the rest of us feel incredibly sort of locked out. But this guy is doing something a little bit different. Prior to his current role, he served as a partner and an executive a global analytics and information provider to then go on through uh, a number of positions his leadership spanning different critical divisions culminating in his appointment as ceo of market serve now recognized for his exceptional leadership he was named ceo of the year at the 2022 markets choice awards additionally has been included in the tab forum 40 top innovators in financial markets lists Beyond his professional compliments, he serves on various financial sector boards, offering expertise and insights that's helping not just to shape the industry, but to shape conversations around the future of technology and finance in all corners of the world and the way that we move money and the way that uh, we understand the potential of currencies in a digital world. I'm Richard Freeman, and this is The Possibility Club, where we tackle complex change with straightforward discussions. And my guest this week is the chief executive of the $3 billion revenue firm, Symphony. And he is Brad Levy. Welcome to The Possibility Club. It's another episode. It's another week. I'm Richard Freeman, and I am joined by a very exciting thinker, doer, uh, entrepreneurial spirit, you know, to help me interrogate change, impact, leadership, the future. Um, And I'm really delighted to be joined by Brad Levy, Chief Executive of Symphony, uh, Zooming in live from New York, I believe, and is going to help me navigate a a system that affects so much of what I do, but is one I probably don't understand anywhere near enough. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested to really get to the nitty gritty of it. And I think Brad's going to help me to do that. How are you? I'm amazing, actually. I feel really great. Uh, I feel amazing. I don't know if I'm amazing. You'll tell me and the listeners maybe uh, after. But no, it's really great to be here. And and thanks so much for having me. I'm, I'm really interested in having the conversation. Thank you, Richard. Not at all. Thank you. So you've got investment banking background, Goldman Sachs, obviously being the, the, the primary, probably not uh, a lot that you haven't sort of been impacted by or been aware of or helped sort of engineer in, in what's been a pretty turbulent couple of decades in the financial sector. What led you to Symphony? What's the potted journey from, from mm. there to here? Oh, that's a good, tough question to start, actually. Yeah. But it's I would say there's, there's I have a, maybe an arc 
I wasn't born into tech, right? I'm old enough, over 50, where just none of the computers, none of the internet, none of the email, cell phone, it just didn't exist when I was young. It sort of came and I just, you know, whether it was video games or just having a computer that you can do something very basic on and being interested in just gear, maybe like bikes, like literally just things in gear. So mm-hmm. I've always had that. And then when I went to university and got into Lehman Brothers to Goldman, like tech was just coming PCs and I really just made it a thing where I adopted it, I adapted to it, and I used it to really compete. And it helped me, you know, I started with no computers really in an industry, and I wound up with a Pentium chip in 95 that was super fast. And it just, I just stayed with that. And then by 2000 timeframe, the internet, and I became more e-commerce after 10 years in banking and working on financing public power plants. And uh, so that's what I did in the the 90s. I was a public power banker in Muni public finance. So and then I went into e-commerce type stuff toward the end when the internet came about. So it was this tech arc, I'd say, that's been a most constant in like my why am I at a collaboration chat fintech technology company now after, you know, 30 plus years and whatever I've been doing. Let's say technology aside, and, and this is this is a big aside. Going yeah, to, it will come in and out, I'm sure. Draw that predominantly, <laughs> you know. Was- what other changes have you seen on on Wall Street in the tw- in the in in the, in the time that you've been working in the sector? I visited New York at the end of June. Yeah, for me, that you know, as a kind of an outsider walking around, there was a sense that it wasn't as punchy and sparky and bustling as it once used to be. It felt a little, you know, there were lots mm. lots of buildings with not much in that kind of used to be a thing. You know, what are the other sort of mm. cultural systemic changes, perhaps that have that have driven? That yeah, so again, when I started in the 90s, there were big floors of exchanges and my my wife was a broker and she worked on the floor a bit. She was upstairs and there was electronic trading in 95 didn't exist. Right. So it was a very physical job. You sat on trading floors. People smoked cigars and cigarettes, literally like on floors in the 80s and 90s. And, mm-hmm. you know, so that really started to fade and trading floors used to be really raucous. And then it sort of started to get more online and 15 years later in 2010, you go to a trading floor, there's a lot of people, but it really is quiet. Um, that's in an investment bank. I'm saying like a floor where traders will sit. Mm-hmm. The, the stock at New York Stock Exchange, there's some people down there, but it really is a place. It's it's somewhat symbolic. There are market makers and people that do some things down there, I guess, but it's more of a, of a place to gather versus a place to actually transact. And a lot of that's now in the wires or just people on the telephones or chatting about it. So New York, you know, those environments, whether it's the CME, the CBOE, the New York Stock Exchange, they've all been sort of brought upstairs. There's a lot more trading and risk activity happening, by the way, now. It's just more dispersed and dis- diffused. New York itself is just a place over the last 10 years that's gone through a cycle. Obviously, the pandemic isn't quite done in terms of office. That's a huge transition. I think we're going to, you know, New- by we, I mean New York We'll make that transition somehow. It'll, it'll, it's definitely going through an interesting time with a lot of things, including immigration. But, you know, San Francisco has its own dynamic. Chicago, you know, San Fran used to be a very big financial center, like, mm-hmm. and it's really faded a bit as that. But it's really struggling, even I'd say more as an urban city. And that's, you know, so when you ask about New York and Wall Street, yes, but that probably was 15 years ago where that really kind of planted where the, mm-hmm. the trading floors and the exchanges, they just became quieter or not even really there anymore. And, you know, the NYMEX would, would go away eventually. And uh, the New York stock exchange is the place, but it's more where, you know, there's TV stations there now and it's kind of, you know, giving you a sense that there's a market mm-hmm. and NASDAQ has its own bell ringing. That's a buzzer. So it's, I've seen that 30 year arc and it's just been fascinating for me. And then this dynamic of work from home, which I'm involved in because Symphony is an enabler of that type of remote work based on where a collaboration technology. So, and I started at Symphony in July 20 in post lockdown pandemic time. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I, I joined a virtual company, um, but I've been involved in chat and all of this stuff since 2002 when we thought AOL chat and Yahoo chat shouldn't be doing a lot of risk trading, which it was up until five years ago, there was massive risk hitting those public chat systems. And now that doesn't happen. But that was a 20 year game of people doing basically real trading on uh, on AOL and Yahoo. So Richard, can I give you a framework that I've thought about a lot? (laughs) I think about like hierarchies and where dependencies are and precedents and like what needs what, right? It comes down to something very basic to build things. You need capital, right? I would say as a basic thing, you need, usually you need funding to do anything, 
then you probably need some form of energy, physical energy to actually produce something, whatever it is. hundred years ago, tech just meant something different. It was probably a manufacturing thing versus a uh, silicon. So I sort of think of finance, tech, and energy as these base areas and then base industries that all other industries kind of need to deal with or interoperate with like healthcare and mm-hmm. movies and retail, right? So you, there's 10 or 20 sectors but I think in terms of finance, tech, and energy, mm-hmm. I happen to have been a power banker for 10 years. Yep. Um, I'm obviously a financial guy, and I think deeply about energy, as I think we all do now with everything going on with climate. So anyway, I think that's a... And yeah, then no, I think of, so there's that. I think of that all the time and that yeah, connectivity of energy. You know, a Bitcoin is code, compute, and cooling, literally. You need to write code. You need to then run a computer and you need to cool it, which you need those three elements to make a Bitcoin, literally. That's why Quebec is big because it's got a lot of hydro and the miners tend to go there when they had to kind of shut down in China a bit. Crypto Quebec. Why? Because they have hydropower, actually. Mm -hmm. And water. I think your, your framework's really, really helpful, and I think, and and, and probably that's just the three that I like personally. Yeah, and 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 I guess twas ever thus, you know, even back in the, you know, the the, the establishment of the Western world, as it were, five hundred years ago, coal, right? Exactly. Steel. You still had energy. You still needed capital, and you still needed everything that you've described. But my question, I guess, is then in the last. 20 years with the advent of crypto, with uh, other. Um, motivations perhaps or people understanding what the power of that capital can do with the with with the rapid advancements of, of, of technology in terms of its impact on speed and on globalized communication so on does that mean there are different people coming into to the system i say this you know cliche you know change is the only constant in the sea of variables whatever right it's just there's constant obviously change is just happening and if you think I think the big difference today, and you said it right there, it's this idea of there's so things are always connected, but the velocity is just so much faster now for one individual or one company. The world certainly feels like it's speeding up, mm-hmm. <laughs> whatever that means. So this the connectivity and the speed and then the connectivity feeding on the speed, then you have this sort of unintended consequence thing. Call it hallucinations and AI, whatever you want to call it. It's like an outcome I wasn't really planning for. Mm-hmm. And at the small group level of, say, a country or really tiny level of you or me, that is really overwhelming, kind of. Like, for us as individuals, we're like, wow, this is insane. For big systems and companies that are really huge and sort of own a lot of assets, they're just mowing through this, right? If you think about large technology and energy companies these days, a lot of things seem to be getting whipped around where they just seem to mow through decades, tech and energy. They all have the ups and downs. Oil goes up, oil goes down. People sell high PE stocks. People buy them. I'm talking like the big cycle of last 50. Those are the trillions of dollars of companies, right? That's Microsoft and Aramco, $2 trillion each or whatever, right? Those are, you know, a bank is 50 billion, 100 billion market cap. That's pretty big. You know, ICE, which is the biggest player in our space, kind of as the market infrastructure exchange. So, you know, they're 100 billion ish, 80. These are small companies. <laughs> It's really so you just I just think about that size and scale and speed of change. And we're just really struggling with it as individual humans or families or communities. And weather is part of that, obviously. You know, we're st- it's still quite traditional and kind of legacy language that's used to try and get their head around it, you know, and people who aren't exposed to. I don't think language changes much over millennia. I think it just changes how it gets communicated hieroglyphically, Hebrewically, algebraically, uh, aromatically. Like, I think these are all just numbers. They're all just ways of us saying, like, good, bad, do, stop, run, go. (laughs) (laughs) I think. I don't know what it feels like. When I look at the cave paintings, I'm like, okay, run. We just overcomplicate it with with new syntax. So you joined Symphony in in in, in twenty twenty. You said you know this virtual company. I can imagine, you know, that was quite a quite a different environment from from where you. By did. the way, I sat in the forty fifth floor of Freedom Tower Tower One at World Trade Center, which to me was interesting because I was at nine eleven. I was at the bombing in ninety three physically, and I then landed in the pandemic in a very quiet time, sitting on the forty fifth floor of Freedom Tower, just looking down on you know a, a, an empty ground zero. <laughs> wow. That was an, it was an interesting time for me personally, to I, be honest, to land at that July 6th, 2020 in a 
I can imagine. So, so talk me through that then. Talk me through that that transition. Talk me through what, what is it that, that Symphony does that kind of caught your imagination? You know, in 2003, we launched a product in the industry called Hub IM. It was a chat platform designed to kind of be secure, be more real time than email, which was starting to really take hold, which was email is very asynchronous and batch where chat and text are more real time. So we want, and then that AOL Yahoo problem was real for Goldman, right? Equities and, you know, gas should not be trading. So we wanted to build an alternative, a directory. That thing was built, came and went, market bought the company, market with an I, where I eventually landed. But uh, in 2006, market bought the company that had that product and then they shut it down in 08. I joined market from Goldman in 2012 and built this product platform called Collaboration Services, a directory and a way to communicate by chat. Actually, we were connecting what was then Microsoft Link, which was the more prevalent DMing thing on a desk. Mm-hmm. Um, there were some things, a number of things happened. I won't go into detail. And then Symphony was created in 2013, 14. We then sold that product we had at market to Symphony. That was my business that That's we great. sold. I then took on Symphony as a product at market and started to implement it in our business and starting to integrate it with our products and workflows at the products I ran at market. Mm-hmm. Flash forward, I wind up leaving, you know, wind up winding down at market in 19 into 20. And I just kind of, you know, thinking about, you know, going into different directions, another operating role, maybe whatever. And then Symphony, obviously, for the 20 year arc I've had was an obvious place that I can go to or would be interested in because I've been involved in the chat space collaboration messaging workflow for 20 years. Mm -hmm. So I came in as president, chief commercial officer in July 20. And then we had a bit of a leadership transition in June 21. And I became CEO. And the pandemic obviously kind of put our technology space on the map with zoom and symphony and teams and well exactly so it just became a we were like a little bit of a peloton effect this podcast is brought to you by always possible but who are we always possible works with ambitious businesses charities and public services that are thinking about what's next From architects to aerospace companies, puppet theatres to primary schools, business networks to big data analysts. If you're wanting to be brave with some big decisions or to be clearer about what to prioritise, then an award-winning workshop from the Always Possible team is a brilliant starting point. We care about just one thing, building ideas that work. For creative, intuitive and practical expertise, consider Always Possible as your strategic partner. To find out more about how we could power up your mission, visit alwayspossible.co.uk. Alwayspossible.co.uk. So I was at 9-11. It was horrible, right? And we really figured out that physically things are interesting, right? When the tower fell, we all had cell phone text mm-hmm. for a bit. An hour and a half in, the tower fell. The big antenna was on tower one. So it immediately we all lost cell phones like at whenever, when tower one fell, Mm -hmm. that was a moment where we literally were sitting, watching news, texting, wives, whatever's going on, people communicating. And we lost text. I'm like, for me, that was a moment because I was in the basement at Goldman, like literally, no, actually I was upstairs, 26th floor. And I'm like, we lost, my wife was in Midtown. I couldn't communicate with her anymore. Mm -hmm. I couldn't communicate with anybody. Then 3.30, I got off the island, whatever. So that was a moment. And I was like, wow, you know, I moved to Colorado from New Jersey before Sandy. That was a big deal. Sandy changed a lot in terms of what people think is possible. The DTCC, the Depository Trust Clearing Company, was 40 feet underwater where actual physical documents were stored in the basement and vaults. You know, I've just seen these things and and communication literally winds up being the thing you need, like at that moment and not having your cell phone battery being down on text on 9-11, obviously then I go into a period of like, I'm not working, I'm getting my home office set up, like I'm going into my next whatever at the end of 19. So I'm getting my Wi-Fi done, I'm getting my mesh net in because my Wi-Fi was crap at home. So I'm getting all set up to work from home in like October, November, December 19, which was interesting because I'm, and nobody's doing that because I'm just doing that because I'm going to, you know, whatever, I'm going to be around for six months, not do, I mean, I don't know. 
And then the lockdown happens in March and I am really set up <laughs> well, because I spent six months and then I figured out how badly everybody was set up to just do their job. Mm -hmm. All the BCP sites for the pandemic that didn't, they couldn't go to SunGuard. There was no, the telephones on traders' desks were not there. They had replicated them in another place, but they couldn't get there. They were home. They were on this laptop. So anyway, and now we're still struggling with Bluetoothing and Zooming and mobile technology. You know, so it's, and then, you know, I land in Tower One in July 20, starting at Symphony, like alone. I was just remote work and I'm a remote work company and I'm trying to get people back to work, but they should be able to work remote. <laughs> I've just seen so much of like how comms comes in and I'm really, you know, yeah. you know, excited to try to deliver the whole mesh of fabric, which is still a few years away. Well, it's an energy, an energy itself, isn't it? That drives all of this, you know, it's, it's, it has to flow. It has to flow fast. And as you say, just and has video is a different energy. If we were just, we're on, we're on audio for this podcast, but we're seeing each other right now, right? Yeah. There's an energy we have because we're physically, if we were in person, it would even be, we'd actually be feeling vibration. Yeah, absolutely. You only feel the vibration here through audio, but someday it'll be, I'll be wearing a suit where it'll tell me what you're really feeling, which will be super weird. <laughs> so, before, <laughs> yeah, let, before, before, that's, why I, that's, that's that like five right. years away. It's technically possible, but that just gets creepy. But, but with, with the, with the, the acceleration of, of the communication needing to, to, to look and feel different or also certainly needing to, to, to cope with, you know, more resilience than, than it had before. Uh, what we what we do know is that the kind of blurring between personal, professional, informal, formal, yeah. you know, it's, it's, particularly in politics, has caused huge problems in the last few years. We can, you know, we've 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 seen, you know, whether it's Hillary Clinton's emails or in the UK, we've got you know treasure troves of WhatsApp messages now betraying all kinds of strange and fast decision making that maybe was a little yeah. less rigorous. January six signal messages exactly. I can only imagine that, that there's been a bit of that in the corporate, the financial world as well. And I am, you know, is, does, is Symphony having a role in terms of looking at the kind of compliance of communication and, and what are the, the kind of principles, code of conduct that kind of un, underpin it in terms of what you're saying to whom, when, and in what yeah. channel? I mean, the genesis of Symphony was the industry needs a platform that is secure, i.e. encrypted. Mm -hmm. And then highly curated in the sense that not anybody can just be on Symphony, right? It's a it's a walled garden, but ultimately inside of that walled garden, people decide who they communicate with, right? So it's very open inside, meaning you can find anybody that you have a desire need to speak to that's on that platform. So it's encrypted. The compliance people, the administrative people, you know, gate, like you can be on Symphony, you could be external, you can send and receive attachments, like all of that administration compliance ethical barriers, you sit at a bank on the buy side, and then you move to sell side, all of your entitlements flip. Like, how do you do that? There's a lot of systems, right? So we're one of those systems that people can chat on internally, externally. So that was the basis of the company. And then ultimately to protect the data of the players on that network. Mm -hmm. right? And that's a big difference between say SMS and WhatsApp, right? WhatsApp is encrypted, SMS is not, right? Signal is encrypted and not owned by Meta. You know, and then we are encrypted on those same methodologies, but we actually do key management differently in cloud and our clients keep keys on their side and we don't even have key management, right? We They have the tools to manage keys to de-encrypt on each end. We run the network and then they curate the relationships and decide what they want to do on that network. So that's the basic premise of Symphony when we started seven, eight years ago. We then bought a trader voice business, which put us more in the highly secure, highly performant telephony world, which is a very unique space, like the the trader um, turrets they're called, or really complex phones you see on trading floors, like lots of buttons talking to floors directly and direct wires and intercoms. So that's a very specialized market. So we acquired Cloud9 and put us in that secure telephony high-end audio. Uh, we also introduced services like launching a Zoom call or a Teams call from Symphony. So that's the more prevalent video conferencing. So instead of us doing that more directly natively, we we can launch services like the Zoom call we're on now mm -hmm. to actually just initiate a call. But from your symphony, you're not chatting on Zoom necessarily, but you're using this part of it. So we're just, you know, that secure montage of half a million, 600,000 users, more than a thousand firms. We think our community ultimately is millions of users, maybe tens, not hundreds. Like we're not hundreds of millions of people on the planet. Symphony, we should be millions. 
but it's really more of a fairly tailored bespoke use case for the user, but a very scalable platform and a very modular way you can use it. Like you can use one thing we do or you can use the whole thing together. We're not bundle, we more integrate and we try to be, again, both open where you can plug in and build to, but secure where you obviously can't hack it and you know, and impersonate people and fish. <laughs> it's a 20, 30 year journey of how all this stuff is developed. And we're just now packaging and connecting like to WhatsApp. We connect to WhatsApp now, we connect to Line, WeChat. We actually do integrate with those services, but for different reasons in different ways, because they're different. There's a simplicity to it. You know, I can see, you know. You know what I have right now, Richard, which is, I just did it with my wife. She was like, I don't even understand how that happened, but I could send you a QR code right now, right? You QR. That QR will come right to my symphony and you just say, hi, it'll bring up your text, your whatever you use, iMessage, and it will bring that up and it will connect to me on symphony. You will then send me a text. Hi, I'll say hi back. So I'll be on symphony. You'll be on your SMS. We're then connected cross. Mm -hmm. You can then call that number and it will ring on my symphony phone or my cloud nine turret. That all just came together in the last year as a product. And all you did was a QR to my text. And that's a big deal because that's a great workflow, but it also solves for a lot of compliance where I need to be on a corporate device or a corporate thing that could be archived where you could stay on your text as a wealthy person and I'm a wealth manager, or you're a corporate in some place in the world, in Africa, Middle East, US doesn't matter, and I'm a banker that wants to do business. You want to be on your SMS, that's fine. I've got to be on something that could be archived. That's fascinating, and 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 some of the language you use, you know, there's there's some blockchain thinking in, in absolutely. In there. But where, but where does crypto sit with this? Since 2015, I believe in those technologies, and it's if I think of distributed work or remote work, we are about that. Distrib, you know, a distributed network that's highly secure. Mm-hmm. We're more about the people on it and the bots and the workflow. Blockchain is a distributed network. It's kind of more at the data block level, like the da- whatever the data is, put it in a block, put it on the edge and give somebody a key if they have a right to it or they created it. There's places where you do need a lot of governance and an Oracle to kind of sit in the middle and go gov- like we think of us as a platform that allows people to govern. We definitely think of ourselves as we're secure people meet secure data. Mm-hmm. I distributed ledger tech and blockchains meet highly secure collaboration communication systems, we definitely meet in the middle. And I could see in five years where these are much more meshed. They may not be appropriate for everything, but there's definitely some tech there that is better at doing things than the things we have today. Who's getting this quickest? You know, are, are there some, some new characteristics of kind of hungry, young? I would say size matters a bit. Okay, Like you need a bit of size, you know, or at least scale or Something to say, I have a bit extra time to invest in things that are maybe, you know, three years out versus three months or six, you know, nine months. So I do think there's a size, but, you know, there are very big firms that just can't move culturally. They just mm-hmm. are sort of thinking, you know, yes, that's what I'm wondering. E- you know. Email is fine. Like yeah, it's, yeah. I use email. I can't, I get my Blackberry back. You know, actually here's uh, <laughs> I'd like to have this, uh, Oh, wow. I haven't seen one of those for a long time. Somebody left this on my chair with my, when I left my last job, it says, Brad, I know I am your favorite device. Cause at some point I had the one on the hip, the Blackberry. And, uh, you know, obviously that went through a whole cycle over 10 years and 15, but, um, I just think it's cultural. It could be locational. Like I think the New York crowd tries to kind of move a bit swifter and not get left behind or even lead the world. And, Maybe other places where financial services are centered are a little bit not as go, go, go on tech. We're looking at the Middle East, right? Tel Aviv, UAE, Abu Dhabi, Dubai. There's a whole thing happening there. You really have to look everywhere, but you have to be mindful that some places it's just not going to be leaping into these new things. And break it to me gently, you know, since Brexit. How how is the UK faring in, in the yeah. kind of global For reputation? So I, I travel enough where I find myself in places in the world when things happen. It's just interesting. I was actually in the UK when Brexit happened. There was a moment where it just tipped. You know, there was definitely a thing driving this idea that separate is just better. And there's something to that where you have a lot more control, but separate is separate too. Mm. And being separate could mean being separate. And when the world gets more complicated, which my view for the last 20 years is it's not going to get less complicated or even volatile, you kind of being separate could be more risky than 
what you have to give up to be together. And I think immigration and all sorts of things play into this. Just in the UK alone, there's still some challenges. Like literally, I'm not, I won't go into it, but it has its own 75-year arc or 500-year arc or 1,000-year arc. But I just organize the world a bit and say, okay, obviously there's a China-US thing kind of going on. 90% of our business today really gets done between North America and Europe. We do 10% in Asia. So it matters, but I'm heavily skewed to the US. I have to think about China and how to do business there and what we should be doing. And our WeChat application works differently than our WhatsApp application, like in terms of integrate. They're very different. Mm-hmm. And then you sort of have this Middle East and Eastern Europe, right? And you really have maybe Saudi Arabia that seems to be in that dynamic. You know, so for me, I think about that first. Like there's a triangle that's developed in the last five years. And that seems to be the, I'm just saying the most recent one that I've heard. It's like Saudi Arabia, China, US. It seems to be playing out geopolitically between those three in an interesting way. Mm-hmm. I just do my dot plot of where I see the alliances and who's more aligned with. I just see that. And it's obvious, right? It's on the news. I'm not, I'm just reporting the news right now. These are facts, I think. Um so I just think about that and I'm like, okay, the UK has to figure things out now as a as a post-Brexit, being more separate, and they probably need to think about really being less separate. It's not undoing Brexit, but it definitely needs to come together with stuff because it's just none of us are big enough to be alone. Do you think there's an increasing role for, for kind of economics and financial instruments to play in terms of kind of global peacekeeping and diplomacy? I mean, we've seen how much. I mean, I kind of like it because fragmentation is my friend because I'm a connector, right? So the more fragmented things get, the more they need maybe symphony to be a bit more connected. Yeah. Brexit will be undone, not by a vote, but by the things below it, the the energy pipelines, the LNG shipping the interconnectedness of CBDCs that will probably emerge in the next three, five, eight, as this whole BRICS currency thing plays out a little bit geopolitically with the energy side. But you guys are going to continue to go through the grinder in Europe and the UK more specifically because it's a bit more separate. And I think that's just a struggle for the next five or 10 years to be a bit more separate. You guys are good. You guys are are strong, hardy. You go through a lot. (laughs) So talk me through the next five years you know, considering what you've done in the last three years with Symphony and and mm-hmm. the the scale, the the acceleration, the the technological changes, how confident are you that you you've got a hold on what the next five years are going to bring? Or I truly believe I, my firm, my people, like I have a hold on it enough where we'll, I'll be, you know, winning enough. Sometimes winning will feel like losing because it's just so harsh. But you're on, you're, you're doing fine. Like it's just you go through it's a storm, and I, I you know been through, I guess, a couple of things that not huge, but big enough to say, okay, you know, we can do do this. By 2030, let's just plant the 2030. It's an easy number. I do think quantum is going to be super relevant. I don't know how, why, or where, but I, I do believe things are speeding up. I think speed begets more speed. I think there's network velocities that interconnect and create perfect stormy kind of outcomes that are just so parabolically fast and you just can't predict it in the weather map. So I think that's happening. And when you go fast, and fast and faster things break it's just a matter of how you know i don't road bike anymore riding physically road biking i just think it's too dangerous i think you're just going to go down someday and you're practically naked and it's just not a fair fight with a car when you're Mm -hmm. like i'm not i don't i'm not doing the tour de france okay it just doesn't make sense for me risk-wise so (laughs) i took that out of my quiver so i think when quantum hits and it will just create a ten thousand step function leap in speed it won't change everything that day, but it will change everything in 50 years from that day. Mm-hmm. And the things that will change immediately could be really big. <laughs> like this GPT day on November 30th last year, it's been a 50 year build, but that changed a lot. How people think, what we focus on, where equity valuations are. I mean, it just changed like things in a minute. Quickest companies to a hundred million, a billion dollars, whatever, like they're just so Quantum for me is actually real. Like in my mind, I have to have a network that is quantum proofy or quantum capable, or I got to be figuring out what my network, where my threat points will be when quantum hits, whatever that means. Again, physicists are figuring that out with mathematicians and computer science people, but that's like five, seven, eight years, right? It's not science fiction. And I think in 40, 10, 3, 190, 62, those are seven numbers. It's like 40-year cycles, 10-year dreams, three-year visions, 90-day to measure, 60-day bursts, and two-week sprints. Only three numbers in there I care about in business really are two-week sprints, 90-day measure, and three-year visions. I'm I'm senior enough to 
be operating to a three year vision. I have the luxury of that, to be honest. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to set Symphony up for a rolling three years all the time. I have a one year plan because we need a plan to budget and you know you have to hit marks every quarter, but you really need to hit your quarterly mark, which is generally driven by your two week sprints. So do your two week sprints to your quarterly mark to your three year vision, and you just do 12 of those every three years and the world rolls on. So the 10 year dreams are like, that's as far as I'll allow myself to think in business, but that's a dream. But I really do believe I operate in a 40, 100 year cycle. And I think that's really, really healthy weather market. And it's probably a thousand or 10,000 year cycle. I just, I can only be so short. I'm not rich enough to be short, but I can be short. I could be paranoid enough to be fast when things are faster than most people. And we're, we're there. Like, I don't, again, I don't need to run the fastest, just faster than most people versus the bears. Right. You know, that's that. <laughs> Absolutely fascinating talking to you, Brad. I've written uh, three pieces that have been published on LinkedIn or whatever. They're they're fascinating. Read them. But really, what is at the end of those pieces, and I can send them along to you, Richard. There's a there's ten or twelve books that I sort of cite as interesting to me. Whether it's um, Innovator's Dilemma or Changing World Order or the Novacine, like uh, Gaia Theory. Like there's just books I'm like or or uh, Sapiens. That's a well known. That sort of changed my concept of cycles with actual data that I kind of believe. Mm-hmm. I'm, So there's a number of books that give me my sort of big cycle view. I would say Changing World Order and Sapiens are the two that are my bookends or Bibles that just give me a real kind of formula for my life, my businesses. So Mm -hmm. I apply that. Nikola Tesla says all the secrets of the universe are energy, frequency, and vibration. Those three words, energy at a frequency emitting vibration. I'm sure you sense I operate a little high vibration. (laughs) <laughs> I tried to make myself a little less sawtooth over my life, but I am from New Jersey, so there's only so much I can do. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I just think in those terms. But at the end of the day, like, what am I doing these two weeks? You know, what's the quarterly mark? And am I doing things that actually will sustain and, you know, are actually helpful maybe? Like, and that's kind of like a intent game. Like, if I have that intent, it'll probably work out a little bit, if not really well. Like. And if not, at least I tried to probably solve problems and create problems, which a lot of people focus on creating quite a bit of problems or just do it accidentally, which I try not to do. Mm-hmm. Brad Levy, thank you so much for being on the Possibility Club. Thank you so much, Rich. I appreciate the uh, time to riff. Thank you for listening to the Possibility Club Practical Bravery. If you enjoyed this episode, do like, share, review, tell everybody about it. Look in the show notes for all the details of today's guest, stuff we talked about, stuff that's of interest, new things to read, new things to listen to. And if you are running a business or a charity and you are trying to accelerate or improve the impact that you have in the world, if you want to be famous for what you do and what you change rather than just what you sell, then talk to us alwayspossible.co.uk We want to hear from you, we want to talk to you, we want to amplify and elevate your ideas, and who knows, we might be able to help you feel more confident and clear about what's next. alwayspossible.co.uk We'll be back in a couple of weeks with a new special guest and a new insight on practical bravery in action. The Possibility Club is an always possible podcast. The interviewer was Richard Freeman for Always Possible and the producer and editor was me, Chris Thorpe Tracy, for Lo-Fi Arts. Have a good week. Alwayspossible.co.uk Lo-Fi Arts